Hello, my name is Andrei and I'm going to present you the paper Right for the Right Reasons. Overall, this is an interesting paper because it presents a new method for regularizing the training process such that the model learns to ignore some rules, learns to ignore some features, meaning you are essentially biasing the model to not learn to use some specific features which are annotated by the users. Let's dive in. We are going to review the paper right for the right reasons. And starting from the title, we see that they want to train differentiable models. So essentially think of it as a neural network by constraining their explanations. So from the title, we understand that the general idea of the method is to constrain the something based on the explanation from training. And indeed, we are going to see that the method boils down to um, adding a new regularizer to the training. But before that, we need to understand um, what's the problem that they are tackling. And they saw the problem that classifiers, actually any model, can make accurate predictions, but for the wrong reasons. So essentially, you, you know, have um, uh, a dog and um, uh, your model classifies the image correctly as a dog. But uh, this is a very ugly dog. But um, it does that not just not because it sees that it's an actual dog and it noticed the fur and the shape, but um, there are some papers which tell that the classifiers um, uh, learn to uh, make the prediction based on the texture of the image rather than the actual content of the image. So starting from the problem that um, models make the right prediction, but for the wrong reason, meaning it doesn't actually understand what we want the model to understand, they come up with uh, the following research question. So is does constraining the model to provide explanations that match domain knowledge cause the underlying behavior of the model to, make, to match that knowledge? So essentially, consider that you have uh, an image, and in an image, we see a tree. So this is a tree, and we see the tree. And we want to classify this image as a tree. Now, you know, any human being would know that, for example, we split this image and uh, in call it regions of interest, and the human would know that only this region is relevant. Let's actually put it. This region is relevant for the prediction. This, 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 and this are the relevant regions. But the human would, you know, know that um, the other regions are not relevant for the prediction. And now the question becomes... What happens if our models, when we explain, uh, when we get an explanation, tells us that these are uh, so-called the relevant regions that he uses for um, making the prediction? Because in this background, you can have, you know, some grass, uh, you can have some hills, and the hills might be highly cor correlated with the class tree. So your model would actually learn to make this prediction based on the hills, but not on the actual tree. But given, you know, human knowledge that this region is completely irrelevant for the prediction, what we can do is that we are going to define a matrix in which we essentially highlight, penalize the model for um, uh, essentially considering this part of the region. So we you know, the domain expert, meaning in this case any human, can easily annotate an image and say, hey, this part is not relevant. If we go, go even more granular, we can, you know, say that, hey, all these parts are just irrelevant for the prediction. And the aim for this is that we, you know, annotate some inputs and we hope 
that the model learns you know more robust features something which it will uh, allow um, the model to you know generalize better but especially give uh, you know uh, better explanations meaning on other examples tell you that hey this is a tree because i actually saw the tree now this paper um, it's interesting in that it explains it actually proposes two um, methods and now let's um, go to see what uh, these methods actually are now we go a bit down we go a bit down and uh, we uh, yes right here so firstly we need to realize um, that uh, so we are considering you know simply just a differentiable model this is important these are the parameters it's important to uh, know that in their notations they use probability vector outputs so these are not logits meaning any random number but in the entire notation they use the actual probability you know like 0 0.1 0 0.2 things like that and we are going to also need to know that they, uh, the method is based on input gradients, which they make this uh, notation. Now, what are these input gradients? Because it's important to understand that. We see that x is the input and yn is uh, one prediction class, because it's y hat. So. Uh, let's think about a neural network. We have the inputs of the neural network. There is something happening in the middle. And then let's say that we have uh, two possible outputs. Now, let's say that in our case, uh, this is our prediction. So this is our y hat of n. And these are all uh, the features. This is x2, x3, 4, and 5. Now, what this thing in the left is, meaning the gradient of um, the, so this is the gradient of the uh, prediction in this case, meaning one of these uh, output probabilities with respect to every single input feature is going to um, compute essentially, hey, what is the gradient of this output probability when I make a small change in x1, right? So now let's say my x1 is equal with, let's say, 2. And now I'm wondering the question, uh, I'm asking the question, hey, how much would, you know, the output probability increase when I make x1 is equal with 2 point, you know, something very small, like 0.111. And this is going to give you the rate of change of the output, meaning this output probability, with respect to every single input feature. So this input gradient is computed with respect to every single input feature. Now, one thing which um, people uh, have the confusion about this is that they think that it has, you know, Typically, when you train the model, you differentiate with respect to the actual, um, uh, you know, parameters in the actual model, like the the, the weights uh, in the model. But in this case, you do not differentiate with respect to the weights. You do not do that. Um, meaning there is no change which happens to the weight. There is no update. There is not that thing. There is no gradient descent, essentially. But instead, you start from the output, you just compute your normal back um, propagation, but you don't make the update. You just, you know, compute the gradient with respect to this weight to this weight. And then when you get into the, you know, input layer, you also compute the gradients with respect to that input feature. But again, there is no um, update to any weights or the input to anything. It's just, you just compute it. And uh, in the literature, it's considered that, um, uh, you know, here you get a gradient. So the gradients, you know, can start from minus infinity to infinity. The point is that they can be either negative or they can be positive. So um, it's, you know, said that uh, an input feature 
is more important when the um, magnitude of that, um, you know, this with respect to x5 of that input feature is higher. So the higher the thing, the more important the feature essentially. Okay. So now that we understood what is this uh, input gradient methods, um, let's move forward um, to see what is their, uh, you know, call it philosophy of their approach, like what's the intuition in, into what they want to prove, and then we actually go to the uh, formula. So they make the assumption, and it's you know, a fine assumption that explanations faithfully describe um, uh, the model's underlying behavior. So, you know, I mean, in reality, this gradient method is not perfect. It's, it's just not. And none of the methods are, you know, faithfully describe the model's behavior. It's just not happening. But, you know, it's an assumption that they make. And my opinion, it's a fine assumption because, uh, um, you know, as this... Uh, interpretability methods keeps advancing and become more and more faithful, uh, this assumption might at some point reach you know, a state where it's kind of true. At this point, it's not, but it's good to know that they make this assumption. And um, then they say that they believe that constraining its explanations, meaning of the model, to match the domain knowledge, meaning the um, annotated... Uh, um, uh, parts that, that we were discussing in this image should cause the underlying behavior to more closely match that knowledge too. So you want to say that, hey, I tell, I'm tell i telling you the model that in this 100 images there are, you know, these pixels which are not important and at some point you should understand that, right? This is our, call it hypothesis. Um, okay, let's... Uh, actually look at the method. So what they are doing is as follows. They define an annotation matrix, which is a binary annotation matrix. And um, it's a binary annotation matrix. And it is, in this case, uh, just for the purpose of defining it, is defined for all the inputs and for all dimensions of the inputs. In the case of uh, images, it's defined for every single pixel, right? So if this is your input pixel, uh, your input image, these are the um, actual, um, uh, you know, features. Now, let me make this thing bigger because I want to make uh, an important distinction here. Now, let's get back our tree because this is important as well. This is our tree. Now, now let's understand what is... Uh, a equal with zero and A equal with one because I had this um, you know, misconception in the beginning. Okay, so it's that A of a feature, you know, in this case we have an image, is equal with one when the feature is thought to be irrelevant, right? So one when it is irrelevant. It's not, you know, intuitive to believe that A equal with zero is irrelevant, but instead it's the reverse. When it's equal with one, the feature is thought to be irrelevant. And when the feature is equal with zero, you know, the feature is thought to be relevant for the actual prediction. And to put this into context, in our case, we would make all of this, um, you know, pixels as irrelevant. And then the other ones uh, remain as relevant features into it. Now, you need to understand that they make, uh, they define it for all the inputs in this notation. But in the actual method, we are going to see that uh, this annotation matrix first, it's provided by, uh, you know, a person, a human, but it does not have to be um, annotated for uh, only some of the inputs can be annotated or should be annotated right N nobody expects that if you train something on image or something you are going to um, annotate a million examples but instead uh, you can just uh, annotate a few of them actually in all the examples we are going to see that you know the entire matrix is you know zero in the beginning 
meaning all the features that are thought to be relevant. This is just normal classification, like normal case, because in a normal model, uh, you know, you just consider all the features to be the same relevant, uh, the same relevancy, right? So A equal with zero is just normal case. And then you annotate, you can annotate only some examples. So you make e A equal with one only, you know, for some, you know, examples um, that you pick, right? This is important to realize. And now let's look to their actual method. Um, this is method one, right? Because they have two methods. This is the method for constraining the explanation in the training loss function. Now let's look at the loss function and it does not look as uh, you know intimidating as it seems. So we have the loss function, this thing, uh, it's nothing special about it. This is just um, the you know normal uh, training loss. Um, right, so, so there is nothing that they added to that thing. This thing is just the standard uh, L2, um, you know, it's just a standard uh, regularizer. Um, they did nothing, you know, special about it. This is not part of their method, they just used. Now, their method is this object, you know, this term which they added. And let's look um, at it. It's again, it's not scary. We see that, um, you know, firstly, notice that it has this, um, you know, hyperparameter, which sets the uh, importance, meaning uh, the scale uh, of this um, term. It, it's very similar with what we have for the other regularizer, nothing special about it. Now, we see that they add, you know, this is essentially this term defines a penalty, but this penalty is added for every single, um, input. So you get an input, you go for every dimension of that input. So essentially you get every single feature of every single input and you add a penalty. And firstly, notice that this is a plus, right? This term in the parentheses, it's square. So this penalty is always going to be positive, right? Now, when A we see that it's this term, our meaning our binary matrix, which is there. And the first thing to realize is that when A equal with zero, right, this case that we discussed, A equal with zero, meaning when the feature is thought to be relevant, there is just no penalty added to our function, right? So they even mentioned at some point, essentially when all A equal with zero, meaning all features are relevant, there is literally nothing happening in their method. It's just normal training. There is nothing. The interesting thing happened when this A is equal with one, right? So we believe that one feature is irrelevant, then we add a penalty. And essentially, I would take this thing out to explain what's the intuition. They add the penalty that the gradient with respect to an input feature, right? This is the input feature uh, D for the um, uh, input N of the, you know, predicted probability. Um, this is what you would want to add, right? Um, and essentially put this thing as being squared as it is above. So for, put it this way, the model is going to train and it's going to, you know, after it is trained, it's going to give some uh, magnitudes of the gradient of the output class. Now, you you believe that this, because this is why you annotate it, you believe that this feature is not relevant. So, essentially, you want your model to not assign any, you know, call it, importance to that feature. You want your model essentially never to kind of look at that feature. And we um, uh, told before that when the magnitude of the gradient of the feature is big, this means that that feature is thought to be relevant. So essentially, you want to make the model to make this thing tend to zero uh, when uh, that feature is irrelevant because, 
you know, if that feature is irrelevant, you want your model to get the gradient of that to be small because you just said before that the gradient is a reflection of how important is that feature. So by penalizing the model to get a penalty when you have high gradients, meaning high you know, importance for this feature, essentially your model is going to learn to know, to have small gradients for this irrelevant feature, right? This is the way that you penalize it. And now, you know, what, what I've just showed you here, you know, this term and this term are essentially here and here. Now you might wonder, because I was wondering why do they actually, you know, I told you the story with you penalize the importance for uh, having high gradients on the irrelevant feature. But here you see that you have a log and you have the sum for all the possible classes, right? The reason why do they do this is that, um, you know, it, there is not much intuition about it. it they, they say at some point that they found uh, this uh, empirically and uh, the intuition that even they provide is not based on this, but um, um, they put this because in the experiments it, it got better results. Nothing spectacular. If, if one of you is curious to look in their code, they have there some experiments showing that it's a bit more stable, but the intuition is not based on them. So I would recommend you to, you know, understand the method based on this intuition. And then whenever you need to code it, you just code it that way. Now we saw this method and this is one of the methods. Um, now let's look some of what some of the experiments which um, are made with this method because they also have another method and um, I think it's better to understand what's the intuition uh, with the first method. So, uh, before we move to the other method. Now, in the experiments, uh, let's look a bit what they say in here. They said that they, uh, you know, make a multi-layer perception with two hidden layers, so it's a very small model. Um, they do nothing special around it. They did some hyperparameter tuning for their lambda one parameter is equal with one. Um, it's said a bit more um, how they did that. Nothing important for our reasons. There is nothing important for our reasons in here um, other than, uh, you know, so, okay, uh, we are going to come at this point now. I want to say that the general feel of the empirical evaluation, it's a very good one, right? Uh, a good one in the sense that they tackle several data sets that they invent and they show that, you know, in a controlled scenario, their method works. Essentially, the data sets are very small. They're like a hundred, one of them is a hundred examples uh, and the other ones are also small. So the data sets are small. They are crafted by them to show different you know, sides of their uh, method. Um, and I think they do that fine, but I want to, you know, get the results with a bit of a grain of salt uh, because uh, they don't actually show this thing in practice. Like the, there is no such experiment of, of like a real, you know, data set um, that uh, they used. Uh, there is one which is about text, but again, I would take it with a grain of salt. But still, their experiments show some intuition about their method, and um, I think they're fine. Let's look about what <laughs> there is actually this method. Um, okay, now, first thing to, to note is that, um, uh, you, you know, until now we discussed about uh, using this input uh, gradients to penalize, to get the explanation using input gradients. But in the literature, there are many other methods for doing interpretability and one of them which was popular in 2017 recently new back then is this method called lime so in many you know benchmarks like lime is better but uh, they they uh, in this image essentially they want to uh, say that hey input gradients is you know giving similar results to lime on let's say on qualitative level similar results the problem is that lime is much slower so lime does something with you know taking a random subset of the feature doing a perturbation so essentially it's very slow it's very computation intensive while 
input gradient is fast. So it's literally very fast. They want to argue that they give, you know, similar qualitative results. Um, uh, actually, you know, they're not almost the same, they're similar to the same, but the main point why they use input gradients is that it's fast. It's just they need it to be fast because at every input iteration you need to compute this and with Lime you can't. So again, they used input gradients because it's fast. Here we invented this toy data set. It's actually very sweet and uh, we should understand it. So let's look at one of these inputs, right? The, so essentially all the you know, colors in these squares are random, except that they created this um, uh, input with uh, two rules. Um, essentially, it's set here. So images fell into two classes with two independent decision rules. So there are all, it's a binary classification, right? Um, and uh, the two rules is one, whether their four corner pixels are all the same color if we look at, for example, this case, we see that the input pixels are the same color. Okay. And the other one is whether their top, middle three pixels are all different colors. So essentially, this is one rule, right? Are they three different colors? Yes. No. Okay. And now how we have these rules that they created this data set based on, but how did they actually make the uh, class, uh, meaning how did they actually, okay, images of class one satisfy both conditions. So it, it satisfies both and images in class two satisfies neither. What you should notice at this point is that the images in class one satisfy both conditions. So if an image has both condition one and condition two, Essentially, you have a bit of a redundancy. Let's look in this case, right? This image satisfies both condition one, meaning the corners are the same color, but also condition two. Uh, so there is a redundancy there in the sense that um, now we look at this point and uh, here they just want to show that um, uh, both lime and this is essentially, you know, gradient. They give qualitatively similar explanation, right? If we look at the first one, they see that, you know, it, it's looking at the corners. Second one, it's looking at the corners. Um, there might be different corners, but in general, um, it's looking at the corners. This is the point that they want to make there. Now, the interesting thing, and this is where they show uh, their method. So, we said that, uh, you know, they have, you know, class one and you have class two. And class two has essentially two features. It has, you know, feature one and feature two, and class two has neither. Now, if you look in this example, their classifier learns to, um, you know, essentially make the prediction based on looking at the corners. You know, the classifiers found um, after training that, um, hey, I can just make the prediction based on the corners, right? When all the corners are same color, then I make, you know, class one, and if not, class two. And um, this is the one, again, there is a redundancy in the rule, so there are two rules. Uh, you are model learned one rule in here that is the corner rule but um, now we want to make the classifier learn the other rule essentially and this is what they do uh, in this case and um, here we do as follows Okay, let's, uh, this is, was a complicated figure, I remember, and let's um, pay close attention in what they're saying. Okay, now, they, let's look what are this um, blue one. So this is the corner rule, and this is the top middle rule. This is essentially, hey, what rule is my classifier highlighting, right? And we see that initially, when the hyperparameter, this is lambda one, if, if it's not seen well, is very small, essentially, you know, when lambda one 
is equal with zero, then it's just normal training. And when it's, let's try it, normal training. And when we have normal training, we see that the model identified only the corner rule, right? But now, in this case, they also annotated A. So they, for every single input, they annotated A such that they wrote into the corners a one, meaning, hey, these are not a relevant feature. Remember that all the other ones are relevant, so the model can you know, be incentivized to use them, but in the corners, they got all this artificial data set and they made the corner is equal to one. So now the model is going to be penalized for having high gradients on the ones. And now they see here that this is again lambda one. So as they increase the lambda one, what happens is that the model starts to you know, not use this corner rule because the penalty is too high. And instead the models, which is interesting, gets to understand and actually find and actually use the um, uh, top middle rule, right? So the model shifts from using one rule to the other rule. Now, again, this is a toy example, so we know exactly that there are just two rules because this is how we created this data set. But it's interesting that as you increase alpha 1, meaning give more and more uh, emphasis or, or, or not using the features that you don't want, the model finds other rule. And this is the point of their um, method that the model stops using the essentially the inputs in which you don't you annotate it that you don't want and the model finds another one. okay now the other one uh, this one is is a bit uh, less relevant this is essentially they they you know they got the alpha uh, lambda one equal with a thousand so they essentially uh, set it somewhere here um, so they did a hyper parameter tuning for lambda one and essentially they look at a hey how many annotations do I actually need? Because, you know, in reality, I can't always annotate the entire data set. Um, true, you, if you have a, a million images, you can't. And they did some hyperparameter tuning, and what they uh, say right here is that they need about 5% of the data set to be annotated. If you just uh, annotate, you should annotate max, you know, about 5% of the data set. But then they think of something clever, and I saw this in some other papers, which is interesting, and that is that um, they say it here. They notice that if you always include annotated examples in the mini batch, right, then you can get out with only 50 examples, and this is, in their case, 0.2% of the data set. So the punchline is that, you know, with a very few annotated examples, in this case 0.2% of the data set, you can find these different rules. Now, again, take it with a bit of grain of salt because it's a very simple data set, but they showed something that, you know, it's not on the order of 50, 70, 80%, but it's still uh, a decent percentage. Now, moving on, um, that we see this, we uh, should uh, understand what um, is the other method that they propose. Okay, this is the second method which they propose. And then we are going to look on more experiments. So their method is that, hey, in some cases, we just don't have annotations. And maybe it's too expensive, maybe it's something, we just do not have these annotations. Essentially, A is inexistent. And now we still want to find another explanation. So we might want you know, to train different models and the models have different explanations. We are looking for getting different models with the same accuracy, but uh, different explanations. And they propose, you know, it's a not a supervised method. It's, it's a very interesting one. 
um, which they propose to do this. You know, they, they say it here, hey, we might always not always have this uh, information, so we want to do something. It's a very smart method, I would say. Um, it took me a while to actually understand what they are doing, but now it's very simple. So, we discussed that you just start with your, it's an iterative one in which we are training multiple models and at the end we are going to have, you know, model one, two, three, many models, essentially an ensemble of models. But training the first model, you start with all features being relevant, meaning equal with zero. And you just train your model, normal training, nothing special with their uh, function. And you are going to get some features which are important. And then what you do is that in the next training iteration, so you train again from scratch, it's just that you are going to train with a change matrix. I'm going shortly to explain how do you change it. And then you do a, another training round. After you trained the model again, you again add some things to the uh, annotation matrix. So you found at every iteration, you find some annotations, you add them, and then you train again and you keep so on. So it's an iterative method in which you train the models from scratch, but the single thing which changes is this... Um, annotation matrix. And now let's explain what they do. We see, it, uh, so this is the, um, you know, the, the gradients given the, the forest training. So uh, you have this function MC where they say that it returns a binary mask, right? So you essentially get some of the features. Which gradient component has a magnitude ratio of at least C? Right, so very basically, say say that you have feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four, and now you know this is the gradients. Uh, you know this is gradient one. Just put it very simply: two, you know, five and ten. So we see that the max out uh, gradient is ten, and now you know this is the uh, gradient ratio with the maximum. This is 0 0.1, you know, this is 2 divided by 10, um, 0 0.2, this is 0 0.5, and this is 1, right? And now let's say that you use C uh, equal with 0 0.67. This is what they used at some points in here, right? They use C equals 0 0.67. Uh, this essentially means that uh, you, you know, get, everything, all the inputs which have a gradient of about 0 0.67, you get these two ones and you make them equal with one. So in this case, uh, A1, right, um, is going to be, uh, you know, 0, 0, 1, 1. Um, essentially what you did is that you added in the matrix, essentially the most important feature. Now the question is, at the next iteration, we so we added the most important features. Then we train again, and we get the previous most important features, and we add again even more important feature. So this is the interesting idea. At every point, we want you know to penalize the important features. So our model finds some important features and we want to penalize them. We want our model to not use those features in the next iteration. Why? Why would you want your model to just penalize the important feature? Well, it's because of what we uh, showed uh, in the previous example. Because remember that in here, to classify as class 1, there were, you know, feature 1 and feature 2. And in the beginning, the model used just feature one. But you want, you know, the model to penalize using this in the hope that it will find another feature. So you penalize an important feature. Hey, I saw, you know, I have the model. I saw that you understand that this is an important feature. 
Now, you know, penalize this, meaning don't use this in the next iteration, because I want to see if you can find other important features. And this is F2. This is why you are the important one. You want the model not to use this important ones to see whether it finds another ones which are important. And in the end, you, you get with many of such examples. One e simple question is, when do you stop? Like, how many times do you run this thing? And the answer is, um, uh, somewhere in here, is that uh, it's you stop when the model uh, stop, um, stops uh, either giving many important features right so you, you know your matrix so it just doesn't find more important features or when the accuracy drops so when the accuracy drops um it means that you know you penalize everything which is important like uh, the model just can't make more good predictions because you already penalized everything um uh, so right if after repeated iteration, the accuracy drops or the explanation stop changing, then we have spanned everything and we stop. And now the question is, hey, we, now we get an ensemble of things. What do we do with them? If some ideas which uh, they propose is that um, you can prioritize labeling or review examples for the assembles. So this means that, you know, you have multiple in, you have one input, Let's actually simply call it just X. Uh, but you have, you know, multiple models. So you have model one, model two, model three, model four, and model five. You got an ensemble and you get the prediction of X. And it might be, you know, uh, class one, it might be, you know, two out of five. And class two, it might be three out of five. So essentially your assemble is very uncertain. It just doesn't understand very well what is this input. And then you can um, give this, this you know, um, input on which the prediction is not good to a human. And hey, is it, firstly, is the label good? If yes, fine. But if not, and this is very smart, you can get this input on which is uncertain. You can ask a human to annotate them. Right, so you annotate and you get this binary matrix, annotation matrix, which they use in method one. Right, you can get you know top hundred examples, give them to a human. Hey, annotate me all these examples which the important and non-important features, such that then I can go back and I can use this method, which is really smart. So they gave you you know call it an unsupervised method to annotate some of the important examples and then to use the other one. Okay, now let's move on to have a brief look on the real world examples because they give some more intuition about what they do. They call it the real world data sets. They are not that very much real world, but um, they are still interesting. Um, we can skip this one, but the two important ones are as follows. This is the iris cancer and the decoy MS. Now, these are both created by them. The interesting idea and the point to know is that these are a bit, you know, call them fake data sets. Um, because in iris cancer, you get, so this is your uh, input matrix. You know, this is X1, X2, X3, X4. And what they do, they get this cancer data set, which has, uh, I think, 30, uh, it has, you know, something like 34 features. So these are cancer features. And there are 34 such features. And then this get this iris data set, which is some flowers data set. It has only four features, but um, they concatenate them. So essentially, they create a fake data set in which they get iris on the class one and class two, and they get the cancer. Cancer is just a binary classification. You know, it's a, a you know, zero, one, meaning do you have cancer or do you not have cancer? And you create this um, new examples. but. And then the uh, prediction is from the cancer. 
So this, let's say it might be here we have two, two inputs which have cancer and two which don't have cancer. But the point which is worth mentioning is that, you know, uh, the iris features are the same for, so the iris features are, uh, they got, they took class one and they added examples of class one for, for the first ones. And then they got examples of iris class two for the second one. And the cancer, you know, this is class essentially, I'm here, I'm writing the classes, class zero, class zero, class one, class one. And they train a model. Now, what we are going to see is that the model understands that um, you don't necessarily have to make the prediction based only on the cancer features, but because the iris features have a direct correlation, meaning you can make the classification from the iris feature to the prediction, because this is how they create the data set, then the model is going to learn how to use the iris feature rather than the cancer features. And then the deco amnist, what essentially they do, I think everybody's familiar with the amnist, you know, they get a digit. So this is just amnist. But the, in the training set, they add a random patch to all the inputs, essentially saying that this is a tree. Um, the value in here is directly correlated with the actual digit. In both data set, which is important, is that this is only the train. So for training and you know validation, this is what they use, but for test in both cases they use the real examples so in this case they use just the three so there is no patch and in this case um, you know they use the just cancer features so the iris are not present anymore this is important and then they want to show um, that their method does what it does here we just prove again that Lime gives similar results to gradient, but it's just faster. We discussed about that. Um, it's good that they included it, but it's not very interesting. Now in here, no, sorry, let's go a bit down. Let's go a bit down. A bit down and Okay, this is the experiment. So given annotations, input gradients, regularization finds solutions consistent with the domain knowledge. Okay, I think it's good to look on this um, examples which they give. Okay, so let's analyze the iris cancer data set. And we should look on the test accuracy when the iris features are in. So we see that when the iris features are in, then essentially we get essentially, you know, like 95 accuracy. But when the iris features are out, the test accuracy for when all the inputs are relevant, right? We look just at this case, it's very it's smaller, is about 0 0.8. So if you get an input that we discuss, and this is cancer and this is iris, Essentially, when you delete the iris feature, there is, you know, like a minus 15% accuracy drop. So this is clear evidence that the model learns to use them. The model learns to do that. Now, yes, the model just learns to use this thing. The model is smart. Now, they want to show that by using their method to annotate a, meaning to tell to the model that these features are irrelevant, then the accuracy actually increases. So they show that when they train with a penalty on the iris features, so essentially they penalize the iris features in their function, essentially by annotating them with one, then they show 
that the model actually now sees the underlying important um, thing, which is that, hey, the label is directly associated with the cancer and not the iris feature. Right, and they they say that they see that just because the accuracy increases. So, to talk again, what they do is that they penalize the iris features, which are clearly not relevant for the cancer prediction, and they show that the model shifts from using the iris feature to using the cancer feature. Pretty good, and it's a very similar examples with the uh, deco amnest with deco amnes. So we look in the test accuracy. When all the inputs are normal, the test accuracy is essentially a random guess because we said that on train, the inputs have a thing there to um, say what is the actual thing. And you notice that the method recognizes that this is what's actually important, meaning the corners, because the train have something. But on the test, um, If the test, you know, doesn't have those, then uh, the model makes random guess because the model learns to recognize digit three based on the corners. So it's a random guess. Now, the important thing is then they show that, hey, if when we train, we penalize these corners, so we annotate them, then we essentially recover the accuracy of the baseline. Essentially, we get high accuracy. And this is how they showed that um, the model learns to shift, essentially to ignore uh, the unimportant features. Now, another thing which is worth uh, looking is how they showed how uh, the other method, meaning find another explanation, uh, works. And I am going to look on some of these examples. So this is. Uh, find another explanation, and this is on the uh, iris cancer, and we are going to also look on the uh, decoy amnest. Let's look in here. Okay, so this is the find another uh, explanation method, and this represents the iteration, meaning every single iteration is a different model. Now, this is the iris cancer, so remember that the iris features are essentially irrelevant. They, they, they should not be considered by the model and you notice that in the beginning the model uses them uh, and it gets small accuracy but as you penalize them the model is able to actually look more and more on the actual cancer features and it recovers the accuracy so you can also see that in the first part so in the first model it has pretty high gradients on the iris features, but then as you penalize them, you know, you see that in here it's very small and then it's essentially inexistent because you penalize them and the model is not going to assign high gradients to them. And what you've got essentially here, it's different models which now you can use for a different reason that we talked about. Now let's talk um, about some limitations of these methods, which um, are, uh, you know, said in. A now let's talk about some limitations of this approach, which are um, uh, said in a following paper, which is called "Learning Explainable Models Using Attribution Priors," and that is essentially that input gradients. So essentially, gradients have the issue of saturation and thresholding so i'm not going into much detail what those issues are but essentially it was shown that um you know the magnitude of the gradients is not always um directly you know correlated with the actual importance of the features because at some point it's just not important this is one thing that they used input gradients, which is not the best explainability model, but again, it is fast. The other th the problem is that they consider just a binary 
mask, right? So it's just a binary mask. Like you don't have weights for every single input. Like an input might be just call it half relevant if you want, um, but it's in this method is just a binary mask. And the other thing is that this method does not consider any interaction between uh, the input features. So, you know, it starts from the same thing that it's a binary mask and um, you can't make correlations um, between features. So, for example, if you want to use this method on, say, some graph structure data, for example, some gene scenario, um, then you can't, you know, specify the interaction between genes uh, or things of that nature because it's a binary mask. These are, you know, some limitations, but the key idea of this paper is that it remains still a relevant paper in the explainability world and uh, it introduces an important idea and that is, hey, you can regularize the uh, method, you can regularize the, the training and um, it will provide, you know, a different explanation. Again, they don't say that after you use this method, it will provide a good explanation. Is They just say it's going to provide a different explanation from the first one, which at least doesn't consider your annotations. Thank you for watching and uh, subscribe for more such reviews if you enjoyed. If you genuinely enjoyed this video, uh, I'm going to do more and I hope that you will and I hope that you are going to watch them. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.